Fora TV. The world is thinking. My brain made me do it. Uh, the idea is about that development in neuroscience, uh, particularly observations of activity in the living brain using techniques like functional magnetic resonance imaging and so on, the kind of techniques that Piero has been involved in developing, have shown that we're not as free or as accountable for our actions as, we've, uh, as we have traditionally thought. Now, this is potentially of great interest to defence lawyers who are, of course, licking their lips at the possibility of, to use Jeffrey's uh, succinct phrase, placing the brain on the stand to take the rap on behalf of the client. They argue that blame lies not with the defendant but with his overactive amygdaloid body, supposedly responsible for aggressive emotions, or his underactive frontal lobe, supposedly responsible for inhibiting such emotions. If our brains are in charge and our bad behaviour is due to them, our attitude to criminal responsibility, to punishment and to preventive detention of individuals thought to have criminal tendencies may all have to change. Well, I believe this conclusion is, to put it charitably, premature. Observations of the brain activity in the laboratory can explain very few things about us. If I speak with any authority, and David mentioned this, it's as someone whose research has been primarily in the area of clinical neuroscience. And indeed, I found techniques such as transcranial magnetic stimulation and functional magnetic resonance imaging and so on extremely useful in research. And that's why I'm very aware of their limitations. They certainly do not answer questions about the free will and in particular about uh, legal questions about the allocation of blame. Actually, we have no neural explanation for very basic things. The fact that perceptions are about things other than themselves. The way our consciousness coheres at a particular time and over time. Our relationship to an explicit past and explicit future. Our sense of being a self and our awareness of other people as having minds like ourselves. All of these, of course, are involved in ordinary waking behaviour. So the question in your blurb, which you'll see, how much can science tell us about behaviour? The answer is not much. The confident assertion that his brain made him do it, except in well-attested cases, such as the automatisms associated with certain forms of epilepsy, or the disinhibited behaviour that may follow severe brain injury, therefore lies beyond our current knowledge or understanding. And anyway, those who want to blame their brains for their misdemeanours should be challenged on philosophical as well as empirical grounds. First of all, why stop at the brain when you are seeking the causes of bad behaviour? Since the brain is a physical object, it is wired into nature at large. My brain made me do it must mean ultimately that the Big Bang made me do it. In other words, neurodeterminism slides quickly into straightforward determinism. Are the brain blamers really wanting to deny anyone's responsibility for anything at all? And I'll come back to that. But interestingly, there's a contradiction built into this plea of neuromitigation of blame. The claim my brain made me do it suggests that I am not my brain, even that my brain is some kind of alien force. If I were my brain, then my brain made me do it would boil down to I made me do it, and this would hardly get me off the hook. <laughs> and yet, but if I'm not identical with my brain, why should a brain make me do anything? Why should this bit of matter single me out? The truth is, if my brain was simply impersonal, if my behaviour was simply due to impersonal brain activity, four of the words in the short statement, my brain made me do it, would look ready for the chop. Made and do go, because I'm not an, if I'm not an agent, it's hardly li likely that my brain, which is a mere physical object, should be a voluntary actor. I can't refer agency to another place in the causal net. And me and my would have to go too, for in the impersonal world of physical determinism, my brain is ownerless. It's no one's brain. And the viewpoint that causes, calls it mine vanishes into a net of causes and processes undeflected by agency, all the way from the Big Bang to the Big Crunch. The trouble is my brain made me do it. It's a way of trying to have a particular brain, both as a first person, me or my brain, and third person, as a material cause, with all the innocence that material causes have. The brain is, of course, the final common pathway of all actions. You can't do much without a brain. Decapitation, ladies and gentlemen, is associated in most cases with a decline in IQ. <laughs> Nevertheless, there is a difference between events that owe their origin to the standalone brain, for example, the twitching associated with an epileptic fit, and actions that do not originate in this way. While we do not hold someone responsible for having an epileptic fit, quite correctly, we do hold them responsible for driving against medical advice and causing a fatal crash. The global excuse, my brain made me do it, would erase this distinction and indeed reduce the whole of life to a condition rather like status epilepticus. And this brings me to my third and final point. In practice, most brain blamers are not prepared to deny everyone's responsibility for anything and everything. While the brain is blamed for actions, 
that attract normally attract moral disapproval or legal sanction, people don't normally pass responsibility onto their brains for good actions or for neutral actions such as pouring out a cup of tea or just getting up for a stretch after a long sit down. When asked why he's defending a client, a barrister is unlikely to say, my brain may be do it, Your Honour. <laughs> and this pick and mix neurodeterminism is grounds for treating a plea of neuromitigation with some caution and a certain amount of cynicism. So we still retain the distinction between events, such as epileptic fits, that can be attributed to brain activity, and those which we attribute to persons who are more than mere neural activity. Deciding on the boundaries of our responsibility for events in which we, can in which we are implicated cannot be handed over to neuroscientists studying the activity of the brain in the laboratory. So the neuromitigation of brain has to be used critically and treated largely with suspicion, except in those instances where there is unambiguous evidence of grossly abnormal brain function or abnormal mental function due to clear-cut illness which may have its origin in brain disease. Our knowledge of the relationship between brain and consciousness, brain and self, brain and agency is so empirically weak and so conceptually confused that the appeal to neuroscience in the law courts, in the police station or anywhere else is to say the least premature and usually inappropriate. And I would suggest it will probably remain both premature and inappropriate for the foreseeable future. Neuro law is just another branch of neuromythology. Thank you. <laughs>